Evening. I remembered it. There it is. That's it right there. Good evening. Welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center. Welcome to HardcoreChristianity.com. I'm Brother Mike. You're in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome to our YouTube listeners. Okay. Got an interesting Bible study for you tonight. I decided to mix in some Christian history, some geography, and some spiritual things all mixed together. Is it going to work? I'm not sure. Take a shot at it. All right, let's travel through the announcements. Those are, those are a lot of fun. All right, the seminar on the false prophet is at the end of the month, September 27th. There's a monster coming. This, is, this guy is the biggest one of all. There he is. Really interesting Bible study on him. All of our teachings at the uh, Arizona Deliverance Center are on our YouTube teaching channel. You just go to youtube.com slash house of healing AZ and bang, you're there. 400 uh, different teachings thereabouts. Uh, if you'd like to help our ministry out, if you're on the internet a lot, just go to Good Search instead of Google. They don't track you. And just put in our charity name and then they'll pay us when you surf the web. It's free money. Now, here's the most important thing the miracle list for mentally ill or troubled Christians, if you don't have one. Please send me an email at mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you one immediately. I got a lot of orders for these the other night. I was on an internet radio program called Luke 418. A bunch of their lister, listeners contacted me and wanted this list, so I was real happy about that. This is a great list. It took me years to develop, but unfortunately, I can't, can hardly get anybody to do it. So, but the ones that do, their lives completely change. There's a deliverance training course. There's 18 classes there if you happen to be feeling led to go into the deliverance ministry. Please be sure you're, you're being led to do that. This kind of ministry is not really for everybody. What's going on in the world today? You can get it, find out on the seven churches of Revelation in the bookstore. You can download our app if you want to donate to the ministry. Thank you. Don't forget about the fourth Saturday of the month. That's important. We have a prayer meeting here in the main sanctuary at 11 o'clock. And then next door, we have our deliverance training class at noon on the fourth Saturday of every month. The donation boxes are on the doors if you'd like to give. Thank you for helping us. You can donate on the website on PayPal. If you go into work 7.30 in the morning, Monday through Friday, I'm with you. <laughs> you can listen to me on the radio, 10.10 10 a.m. Christian Radio. been on there for 21 years. And Saturday and Sunday, I'm also on the radio. Sunday morning, I'm on my podcast, twitch.tv. I hope you'll join me. Just put in uh, HCCABC and you're there, 9 o'clock Sunday morning. YouTubers, as, as uh, I mention every week, you need to set up an ambush team in your church. It's like the CIA. You get two or three people together, and then you start finding sick people in your church. You separate them. You pray for them in private, and they get healed and delivered, and then the word of mouth spreads, and then pretty soon you got a whole lineup of people coming to you for help. It's a real easy way to start to start your ministry. Works best in a mega church. It's harder for them to track you down there. Don't forget about this Zoom. This thing is the this is a vicious bomb. What a great service every Wednesday with Rick and uh, Stephanie. It's off the chain. Six o'clock. 
you can send me an email and I'll send you all the information or you can get it off the Facebook I wrote three books here they are one on uh, One on Christians with mental illness, one on healing, one on Satan. Speaking of plan of spirits, Julie's teaching a class on it, on uh, the root cause and cure of mental illness. Uh, you can get the book in the bookstore if you want to join the class. Tuesdays, 6.30. Here. Don't forget about our Saturday Zoom with the Carters, 6 o'clock. Okay? You can send me an email. I'll send you the information if you like. Or you all can get it off Facebook. Our children's deliverance services. These things are fantastic. Couldn't be prouder of them. October 5th, 10 o'clock in the morning. Small sanctuary. Pre-teens. It's really fun seeing kids get delivered. That is great. Tonight's broadcast is on YouTube and Rumble. I think. And it's later broadcast on Vimeo, BitChute, and GodTube. If you're interested. It's also on Odyssey. This thing's going so well. Uh, I asked Jennifer if we could start promoting it. This thing is fantastic. We have a worship service here. Sundays at 3.30. Wow, this thing is fantastic. Not doing deliverance or anything like that during the service. I guess there's deliverance or something after the service, but during the worship service, 3.30 Sunday. Wow, the anointing's been wonderful. So I thought, well, we got to start sharing it with everybody. Instead of just word of mouth. 3.30 Sunday. Boom. Today. Bible study. Shipwreck. Lord, thank you for this one. Amen. Acts 27, as you know, is near the end of Paul's incredible ministry. And uh, Paul always had a dream. Do you have a dream? No? Well, Paul had one. Had it his whole life. He always wanted to go to Rome. That was the dream of his life. He wanted to go to Rome. Rome was what? <clears throat> the center of the planet Earth at the time. The greatest city in the world. Super populated. Paul always wanted to testify in Rome. And God told him that he was called to go to Rome. That was his call in life. That was the accumulation of his ministry in his life. That was everything he dreamed of. I remember when I was a kid, I started boxing in uh, eighth grade. I had this dream. I always wanted to be the heavyweight champion of the world. That was my big dream. Never happened, but the good thing about having dreams is they're motivators. You know, and if you're not mentally ill, you'll have a realistic dream. If you're mentally ill, you've got wow, wild pie in the sky that doesn't work. But if you've got realistic dreams, and those are very good for you, it keeps you going in life. And Paul always wanted to go to Rome. Well, as you know, uh, in Acts chapter 26, Paul got in big trouble. Uh, the Jews were after him and they wanted to kill him. He got tried and uh, what was it, Agrippa and Festus, they thought he was nuts. And so Paul, being a Roman citizen, in addition to a superstar Pharisee at one time, appealed to Agrippa and said he wanted to take his case to Rome. And so Agrippa agreed and said, hey, this guy's, let's get this guy out of here. And send him to Rome to be tried. I want to get rid of this mess. And here's where Caesar lived. It's all ruins now. 
but they lived in a giant castle, so to speak. There's the Roman Colosseum, the biggest thing in the world at the time, greatest city in the world at the time. Acts 27, chapter 1, he is being uh, sent to Rome to go to trial. They were to sail to Italy, and they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners to Julius, a centurion of the Augustus band. A spira was a, uh, an army of 400 to 600 men. This guy was in charge of a spira, and that means he was some big shot in the Roman army. And uh, he was in charge of taking Paul and other prisoners loading them on a boat and taking them to, to Rome. It says, entering into a ship at Adramatum, we launched sailing by the coasts of Asia. And it says, uh, Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us, he was Paul's partner. Do you remember him? He was a born-again Christian, and he was working with Paul. He was one of his partners. Paul was not only... Uh, on the ship, but other Christians were on there, along with a truckload of convicts. They were all being shipped to Rome, probably to be fed to lions. Well, Luke was on the ship because he was there and kept using the word we and us, and he wrote this book of Acts, supposedly. So we know Luke, uh, we know at least three of them were on there. Here is the actual ruins of that city. And this is the Adriatic Sea, the coastline. Here's some of the ruins of the actual city that they were headed to. And here's the map, you know. He starts here, and then it shows where Paul goes. You know, he goes to here, Myra, and he switches ships. So he boards an, an Egyptian cargo ship. He ends up over here shipwrecked at Malta, and after several months he gets on another boat and heads to Rome. Now this all happened in about 59, 60 AD. So this was 60 years after the resurrection of Christ. Paul finally got to live out his dream. Now remember, God called him to Rome. He didn't go there because he decided to go there or he wanted to go there. Paul was smart enough to wait for God to call him to go. Yeah? And I can't tell you how many people have been in my office over the years telling me that God called them to do this, God called them to do that, God called them to do this, and it turned out to be some whopping disaster. And I'll explain that in just a minute. But Paul is being sent to Rome, and Paul was probably the greatest Christian that ever lived. And he's on a prison ship. Okay? God told Paul he was going to go to Rome, but didn't tell him how he was going to go to Rome. Okay? And Christians in America don't like that. They, they want to know what God's call is on their life, and then they want all the details. Well, that's, that can be a problem. If God's called you to do something, there's a pretty strong probability you're not going to get any information about it. Right? It's a faith walk, not an intelligence walk, if that helps at all. Paul, I'm sure he didn't want to go to Rome on a cargo ship loaded with convicts to be tried, but listen, the good Lord works in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. Well, the next day they went to Sidon, and the guy running the uh, band evidently knew Paul or respected Paul or something, but uh, he gave Paul special favors. He evidently didn't think Paul was a convict or was being persecuted for something, or so he might even been saved. Who knows? But anyway, you know. When God calls you, if he's truly called you, and you haven't decided to drift off on a path of your own, God will provide. And even though it doesn't look like you're going to make it, God will take 
sinners and unsaved people and have them take care of you. And this guy here is taking care of Paul. And it says, when we had launched, we, meaning Luke and the rest of them, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds started to get jacked up, started getting weird windy. And then, when we sailed over the Sea of Sicilia and Pamphylia, we came near to Myra, and then it says, there the centurion found a ship from Alexandria, Egypt, sailing to Rome, and he put them on there. And that was a cargo ship from Egypt. At that time, Egypt was the number one exporter of products in the world. They load them on ships and they went everywhere. Egypt was rich. And the ships they used were Ubers. So they would load the ships, and this one in particular was loaded with grain, corn, stuff like that, headed to Rome. So this centurion guy puts all the prisoners off of his boat onto this cargo ship. They took them. Here it is. This ship came from Alexandria, Egypt, up the coast, headed here, going like that. Boom. This was a six-month trip. So when Aquila said, hey, you appeal to Rome, Caesar, you will go. He didn't know it was going to take at least six months to get there. But Paul readily went, and he was happy to go because... Several years ago, God had told him, you are going to witness for me in Rome. And so Paul went along with it because that was his dream in life. You got a dream? Raise your hand if you, if you have a dream in life. Anybody? Not too many. One or two. Oh, three or four. Hey, wow. Well, this is going to get good. Paul didn't know he has, his dream was going to include traveling with convicts and switching to another cargo ship halfway there. Yeah. What's the lesson you're learning here? Hey, if God calls you to some ministry, he's not going to tell you how it's going to materialize. He's not going to explain to you, well, you're going to have to go here and there and there, isn't it? You know, sometimes you don't know anything that's going to happen. Well, the cargo ship's a good illustration. While you're on your cargo ship to glory, if you run into a bunch of adversity like we'll see on this trip, and you don't have any patience for it, and you start getting fussy, start complaining, griping, pitching a fit, getting confused, Hey, the good Lord, he'll pull the ship over and dock it for a while till you change. You wouldn't believe how many people have been in my office over the years, wasted half their destiny. You know, they got called when they were 15 years old, now they're 40. Kept getting pulled over, parked. There the ship sat, there they sat. What's he do? He pulls over. He pulls you over until you have a, what we call an attitude adjustment. Hmm. Those are interesting. My. Well, Acts chapter, verse 7. Then we started sailing slowly for many days, and scarce were come over against Thetis. The winds were not allowing us. Okay? This is a trick of the devil here. This is a real easy one to spot. He'll get you to sail a little bit off course. You know, not a dramatic turn, but just put somebody in your way, some funny thoughts, some weird church people, some people with negative attitudes. Just kind of, not a big deal, just kind of an infiltrator. 
you know, like that movie Terminator, these machines had the exterior of a human. So they would they would infiltrate. Nobody, nobody really knew what it was. And that's what the devil does. He'll he'll get you sailing kind of slowly in the wrong direction. It's just kind of a drift. It doesn't look like much. You're not going very fast. It's just kind of a just a little bit off course. And then and then he makes another move later. It says here, we sailed under the island of Crete. Crete! Does that ring a bell? Yeah. They were at the Pentecostal revival in Jerusalem. Remember that? The Cretans were there. Acts chapter 2. Greatest revival in history, the start of the church. And Paul even mentions, he quotes a prophet here in Titus chapter 1. Remember that? That, that prophet said that the Cretans were lazy and liars. Remember that? <clears throat> that isn't a good description of you. You know, that's, that's not what you want people saying about you. You're lazy and you're a liar. That can't be good. Then Timothy, he said, remember that? He told him to appoint elders in every city where he had set up churches over there. It's amazing. The liars and the losers and the lazy people heard the gospel and they had churches there. Remember, this is 60 years after Pentecost, 60 years later. Interesting. And then it says, hardly passing, it came to a place which is called the Fair Havens. That was uh, in Crete. That was a port there. Okay? And here's the picture of it. Believe it or not, Fair Havens is around to this day. It's in Turkey now. And then here it was right here. And that port is still there. That's a recent picture of it. And that's where cargo ships would come in and dump their loads and pick up other ones and transport people and everything. Almost like the city bus service. And it says, when much time was spent, sailing was now dangerous. See, they started out and they were just going really slow. The wind was slow. You know, there wasn't much wind, so the boat couldn't go very fast. That's how the devil does it. He just comes with you, just maybe a thought, maybe somebody with a bad attitude. They're not overt about it, they're just kind of kind of a semi-downer. Somebody to get you off track a little bit. A relationship, you find somebody, oh, I, I, I'm attracted to that person. Oh, and then you, then the demons start helping you in your mind. Well, maybe, maybe they can help you in your call. Oh, that's a good idea. And all of a sudden, you kind of just a little drift, drift. And then later on, boom, boom. Suddenly, the sailing got a lot worse. It's, he starts out slow. And then it gets bad. The fast was over. What the, the Day of Atonement? The fast was over, and the sailing now became dangerous. The weather started to go really bad. And Paul said, Sir, thereo is the Greek word for when you see something and it becomes clear. My guess is here, and I can't prove it, but my guess is I think Saul. Paul saw a vision of what was going to happen. I'm not sure of it, but maybe he was told in his mind or told in his spirit or something. But anyway, somehow God explained to him that they were heading for the gates of hell. And there was going to be incredible damage and death and everything on this voyage. Not, a, not only, he said, of the fortas, the cargo, but of our lives as well. He's warning them and telling them, hey, you know, the good Lord explained to me we're in trouble here. We're in bad shape here. Somebody needs to listen to me. Well, it says in verse 11, nevertheless, the centurion did not listen to Paul. He listened to other people. When the devil starts to drift you off, your, off course from your call, the Holy Spirit in love always sends you a subtle message. 
somehow, sometimes weird things, could even be a dream, could even be somebody just saying something off the cuff, something like that, something comes in to try to get you kind of drift back over here before the dangerous winds kick in here. And then you have to sit in Brother Mike's office when you were called by God to preach when you were 15. Now you're 40 and you're still not preaching. Start out slowly. Now hell is about to break loose. Well, he, they talked it over. The centurion said, you know what? We're going to go anyway. And he said, the reason they want, why? Because uh, Fair Havens, you know, that wasn't a good place to stay for the winter. There wasn't enough accommodations. There wasn't enough places to eat. Uh, you know, a lot of the fast food joints now are shutting down. Looks like they shut down there. No place to go. Nothing going on. No hotels. Nothing. They didn't want to do it. So they ignored what he said. In essence, ignored what God said. And decided to, decided to go to Phoenice. They wanted to winter there because there was plenty of facilities. That was part of Crete. Crete. Okay, here it is. And the funny thing about Phoenice was it had two ports, and they were interesting because one port you loaded up your cargo, you dumped your cargo, you loaded it. It was facing the northwest. The other port faced southeast so that the ships that would come in, depending on what direction the wind was blowing, they would go to that port so that when they got done, the wind would take them out. Plus, it was a big city and there was all kinds of places to, you know, eat, sleep, all that stuff. Here's where they were. They wanted to go from here to here. And again, Italy's up here, right? They're on their way again. Phoenix is the Greek word, and that the English word for Phoenix is yes. We live in Phoenix. Did you know that? Anybody born in Phoenix? Nobody. Everybody. You were. You were born here. That's amazing. <laughs> you never run into anybody born here. But, sir, you are a Phoenix man of God. Did you know that? That's where we got the name Phoenix. I like to throw in a lot of trivia because it's deep. Okay, they, go to, they want to go to this port for obvious reasons. It's got great advantages. But, but, they decided to go because why? The south wind was blowing very softly. Oh, here comes the devil again. He, he sometimes he never starts you out with a bang. He always starts you out with this a subtle little push. He kind of gives you a pat on the fanny. He gives you a compliment. Builds up your ego a bit. Kind of gives you a little push. It's kind of a gentle thing. It's not often a car accident. And they go, hey, the, the winds aren't bad. Uh, we, can, we can pull this off. No problem. And they take off. They ignored what God said. And it looked like it was a good deal. Okay? They were trusting in their own wisdom and their own knowledge. Right? And they, and they left. They loaded up the prisoners. Everybody left. Well, what usually happens with the devil is he gives you a little blow. He gives you a little poof like that. Kind of blows in your ear a little bit. Kind of chews on your earlobe. You're doing a good job. You're smart. You're good. And then this shows up. There it goes. <clears throat> hmm. Not long after. It usually isn't long after. There arose a Tephonicus. What is that? Whoa, it's a typhoon. We call them hurricanes. Herocliton means an east storm wind came up. 1516, when the ship was caught 
They could not bear up to the wind, meaning they couldn't drive the thing anymore. They just let it go. That's very bad. When you can't control your ship, you in some big trouble. They ran uh, near an island called Claudia. It's now called, called Gaza. And we had much work to come by the boat. Well, what, what are they talking about here? What's a scaffy? It's a it's a lifeboat. These big cargo ships would tow uh, lifeboats in case something happened. And the wind was so bad, this thing was going to get flip and go to the bottom. So they're pulling in the lifeboat to save it because the wind was vicious. Okay? And when they took up the lifeboat, they then used helps undergirding the ship. What is that? Well, all these big cargo ships had all these long chains and ropes that they could put along the hull of the ships to keep them steady when the waves would pound into the ship. These chains and ropes would give them a little more stability, keeping the thing from cracking and sinking. So now you can tell they're desperate because these ropes and chains, uh, the Boethia, they were not normally used. They were rarely used, only in emergencies. So now these guys, are, these folks are screwed. Fearing, lest they should fall into the quicksands, Certus is a beach. They didn't want to get beached. So they uh, strake sail and they were being driven by the waves. Kalao means they lowered the giant mass. They just dropped them because they couldn't control the ship anymore. And if you leave them up, if they break off, you're dead. You can never control the ship. So now they're really scared. They're fighting as best they can to save their lives now. Being exceedingly tossed with the hurricane, the next day they started throwing stuff off the ship because they wanted to keep the ship as light as possible to keep it from sinking. Now remember, Paul is called by God to go to Rome. <clears throat> You've been called to do something, I hope. Well, wait a minute. I, the guy on the TV preacher said, Soon you get called, and you know, it's smooth sailing. Just use your faith. Why don't you just speak it out? Right? Speak it into existence. Got financial problems? Talk to your checkbook. <laughs> We're word of faith people. <laughs> yeah. Word of faith people. Stupid. The great apostle Paul is not having a very smooth trip, and he's been called by God. What are we learning here? Hey, listen. If you've been called by God, you may have to face some adversity. It's not smooth sailing like my Kenneth Copeland manual told me. My manual, I found a trash can and put it in there. Paul is getting blasted here. He's in the storm. He's on the boat struggling for its life. They didn't listen to him. That should have landed. When you get called by God, sometimes people don't care about your call, including other Christians. They don't give a rat's fanny what you're called to do. They're not going to support you, and they couldn't care less. And they're not going to listen to you, even though they know you're of God. They knew Paul was of God. They respected him. They could tell he was a man of God. And he's going through all this trouble and he's called. How does that work? No, something's not adding up here. The third day we cast out with our own hands. The skue, they started throwing everything off this boat. Trying to save their lives. 
trying to keep from going under. And Paul's on the boat. Luke's on the boat. Other Christians are on their boat. The convicts are on the boat. The people that own the ship are on the boat. And they're all staring at death. So they're trying their best to stay alive here. When you get off course after God calls you, you know what you're going to have to do to get back on course? You're going to have to get rid of some crap out of your life. You're going to have to start throwing stuff overboard. Maybe some crappy friends, maybe some unbelievers, maybe some bad attitudes. Maybe, maybe people you don't like and you take offenses. Maybe that stuff has to be tossed overboard. Just a thought. To save your call from God, you might have to make some important life decisions. Oops. Oops. And then it says, the end came, when neither sun nor stars in many days never saw any of them. It was nothing but a typhoon. You couldn't see the stars, the moon, the suns, nothing. All you saw was the storm. And uh, they were getting blasted, it says here. I'm paraphrasing. And then it says, the worst thing that can happen to a human is what? Right here. Right here. Right here. You're sitting there in the crisis center, right? You're answering the phones. Hello. Phoenix Crisis Center. Guess who's on the other end of that line? Someone who lost hope. They're about ready to go. What's the devil's goal in getting you to lose your hope? I just told you. He knows if he can get a hopeless person in his hands, he doesn't have to kill them. They'll kill themselves. Once you lose hope, it's over. It's all over. Just this week, my sister from Kansas calls me. You're not going to believe this. So-and-so at our church, he'd been there for 12 years. He used to run the children's ministry, he and his wife. Everybody loved him. Great guy. Everybody in town knew him. He was an HVAC like air conditioning guy. Thirty-four. In church for years. Nobody at that church knew what a demon was. It bit him in the nose. Nobody in that church had any spiritual warfare skill. Nobody could help that guy. What happened to that kid? Nobody knew, but something here became hopeless. And when you lose hope, you become an expendable person. You no longer have value to yourself. You may have great value to others, and you probably do. Doesn't matter. That's the devil's number one goal. He wants you to lose hope. We had lost all hope that we would be saved. Greek word sozo, delivered. That's the same word uh, it's used when you're talking about somebody getting saved or born again. Saved. But here it means their lives saved. Romans chapter 8 here, Paul puts it in the perfect perspective when he was in Rome writing his one of his letters. He made it to Rome. He says, we are sozo, we are delivered by Hope. Why? Hope. Hope is future tense. Not present. Yeah. In another spot, Paul said, you know, if all we had was what we have here, we are the most miserable religious people on the planet. We all suck. What? What do you mean? 
we're ministering, we're saved, we're speaking in tongues. Doesn't matter. Glory is our hope. If all we got is this, Paul said, we're the most men most miserable. When somebody loses hope, they don't see their future anymore. They're blinded. It's gone. We are saved, delivered by hope. Sure. If you see something, it's not hope, right? Because hope is future tense. If you see something, why are you hoping for it? I hope I get a chair to sit up. I'm stupid. What an idiot. I'm, I have the chair. I'm sitting in it. I don't need to hope to sit in it. It's right there. That's what he's saying. And he says, if we hope for what we don't see, then with patience, we wait for it. Wow. Paul's called by God to go to Rome. That was his dream of his life. And now he's on a ship about to go under. He's in the middle of a typhoon. They're throwing stuff overboard to survive. He told him what to do because God told him what to tell him. And guess what happened? Nobody listening. Just like your church people. Hey, I got a good idea for ministry. Bag it. And they walk off. They're not interested. I've been praying the other night and I thought, talk to the hand. Nobody cares what you think at church. No offense. You got to have patience to make it. Well, here Paul is on a ship ready to sink, total calamity in a hurricane. Now that's patience. Why did Paul have patience? Why didn't he crack up? Because he'd already had God's word. God had already spoken to him. And so he knew victory was ahead. Didn't look like it. Didn't feel like it. Didn't sound like it. Faith supersedes what you see and what you hear, what you think. Paul's on the ship and hey, he's just going to keep moving forward. Because God gave him his dream to preach in Rome. Well, after a long abstinence, it says, Paul stood forth and said, Sir, you should have listened to me. We should never have left Crete. Well, no kidding. We would never have lost all this equipment, all this cargo, and how it had all this damage to the boat. None of this would ever happen. Had you just not drifted off course, see? It was just a little blow. It was just a little word. Sometimes just one thought. Something subtle. Something little the devil comes with you with. And so it's just a little thing, you know. And then the hammer drops. Now, he says, I exhort you to be of good cheer. Euthymia, what does that mean? It's a Greek verb, but it's a weird verb. <clears throat> Check this prayer out. Lord, I'm down in the dumps today. Will you cheer me up? What's the answer to that prayer? No. The Greek word means you cheer yourself up. Right. Yeah. I tell you something positive. You're going to get a delivery tomorrow in a letter. You won the lottery. He never cheered himself up. See him sit there? That's what God does. He tells you, hey, I'm giving you these blessings. This is my promises. This is the glory. Now you cheer yourself up. Most people want God to cheer them up. Can you tickle me? Can I? We cut. No, he's waiting for you to do it. You do it. So now Paul is giving them the, God's word again. He says, hey, I exhort you 
You, it says. Not me. I'm not cheering you up. You cheer yourself up. It's a male. There shall be no loss of life among you on this ship. The ship's going down, but you're not. Wow. What's wrong with the good Lord? He must have mental problems. Now, you called me to Rome, right? Okay, now I'm on a ship that's going under. I'm stuck with a truckload of convicts. Let me give you some deep insights. Convicts are not normally the type of people you like to hang around. They got personal problems. Now I'm in a hurricane. Okay. Not the wind blowing a little bit sometimes here in Phoenix. We get wind here. Okay, that's nothing. Okay. I don't know why the good Lord would put him through this. Hmm, let me think about it. Maybe he was in training to face what he was going to face in Rome. Hmm. This is an interesting thought. There's no loss of life here, but the ship is going under. Why? Because I heard from the Lord. An angel stood by me this night. He told me. I got it directly from the good Lord. You know what he said to me? Yeah. The devil just kind of drifts you off a little bit from your call there. Then he blasts you with a disaster. And then you start panicking and you get scared. Well, as soon as you get scared and you start panicking, that's when he's got you. 169 times in the Bible, God told somebody to. Why? Because he knows better than we do that fear is the devil's controller, he's a control freak. He'd kill you if he could, but he doesn't have the power to do it because the Holy Spirit holds him off. But fear is like strings on a puppet. They get you to behave in ways you wouldn't normally behave. Fear is the devil's whip. He whips Christians with it. As the first thing Jesus said to the disciples, they're all standing in the room. He appears in the middle of them. Poof, there he is. Where'd you come from? Fear not. Praise God. 169 times God told us not to fear. He's got this thing covered. It's in the bag. Now he's telling a boatload of convicts in the middle of a typhoon to fear not. Fear not, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. God has given you all the people you've been sailing with. Wow. Now that's mercy, isn't it? You wouldn't think that God would want to save a bunch of convicts. Convicts, actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he likes convicts first. He likes to save people who nobody else wants to save. Yeah. He likes to save people at the bottom of the barrel first. They go first. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Paul, I'm going to give you all these convicts on the, sh on the ship for you. They're all going to make it. Acts 27, verse 25. Wherefore, sir, be of good cheer. You cheer yourself up because of what I'm saying. I believe God. What's he training us here? Paul stayed with his calling, even though his whole world was falling apart around him. Everything went bad. Steady. Patience. He stayed steady. Patient. Some angel popped in. What are you doing here? 
I'm a messenger boy. I got a message for you. Hallelujah. And the boat's going down, but you're not going down. Go ahead, so, Daniel saw that boat. Daniel saw that boat. They tossed him in there. There you go, lunch. They peek over there. Hey, there's a fourth man. Praise God. <laughs> somebody else. Somebody showed up. Amen. Why, Daniel? I got my call. I'm going to stay steady here. Hell has come for me. I got, I'm up here. They're down here. Yeah. Everybody else that had been tossed in there was lunch. 100% of them died. You couldn't get out. Lions are unfriendly, particularly when they're hungry. They got social anxiety disorders. They peek down there, and Daniel goes, Yeah, it's me. I'm down here. It's all good. Paul said, It's all good. Typhoon. I'm good. Why? I heard my call. I'll stay here patient. I know somebody's going to come through for me. Somebody's going to come get me. Come on now. I believe God. <laughs> That's what Brother Jerry has said in the middle of the street in Jericho. Yeah, I believe God. My daughter just died, but I'm going I'm to keep going home. I'm going to go. I'm going to go home. That's what, brother, that's what the two blind men said. I said, I believe God. I'm going to follow this guy down the street. How are we going to follow him? Like we follow everybody, using our ears, using our smell. What does he smell like? What's he talking? Let's follow. Two blind men following you down the street. Uh oh. They felt called by God to follow when they couldn't see. Blind Bartimaeus said that I believe God started yelling on the curb Panhandler homeless A societal loser a piece of human garbage not today Now nah. No He was in the middle of a typhoon flat broke with a pottery cup And he couldn't see anything <laughs> This guy's in the pits of society What's he doing? Using his what's that? Yahshua. Here? Uh oh, that's my cue to go get my miracle. See, you can't get a miracle sitting there. You gotta go get it. Right. How come God doesn't do this and that? Because you won't go get it. Why? You're spiritually lazy. See? You're a Christian. You're a you're a you're a liar. A loser and you're lazy Go Well, God's supposed to come help me. No He already helped you go get it Go for it Make your move That's how this faith thing works nobody knows that I Don't know why they don't know it I mean, I teach it all the time. I guess nobody listens to me you got to get off your dead butt. <laughs> My butt's gone. It's all worn out. But <laughs> what you got to do to get a miracle from God is get off your butt and make a move. That's how it works. The woman with the issue of blood, dripping, cervix cancer. I'll just sit over here and wait for God to come over. No. No, excuse me. Excuse me. You've got to do something if you want a miracle from God. Sitting there will accomplish nothing. And nobody's going to come help you. Well, this isn't an uplifting message. Yes, it is. I believe God in the middle of a typhoon. It works. Paul's telling you it works. It's right here. He says, however, we're going to be shipwrecked on an island. 
well, we better get the good Lord in therapy. He just doesn't know how to fulfill people's calls. You don't have all this problem when you get a call from God. See, you're smooth sailing all the way. Is it really? No, not when you need to be trained to fulfill your call when you get there. You need some training. See? You don't need to go to Bible college and get a certificate. You need Holy Ghost training. Sometimes that requires adversity. Adversity, no! Oh. Adversity is your best trainer. Tough times make tough people. Yeah, people who have been trained and who are disciples, the devil doesn't push them around anymore. He gets pushed around. They got trained. They develop patience. They stop taking offenses. I mean, you don't take offenses when somebody wrongs you? No, you don't. You learn that that's a setup. You learn that person's only aggravating you because they were sent there as a plant. Trying to get you off your game. See, as soon as you drift off, it's just a... We don't like you too much. You don't kind of fit in here. Kind of. Then pretty soon, boom, it's a typhoon. Oh, we're going to get shipwrecked on an island. Jeez, how great. This is fulfilling my call? Yeah, he's fine with it. Uh oh, and the 14th night came. They were driven up and down the seas, the Adriatic Sea. About midnight, the shipmen drew near to some country. They couldn't tell what it was. The weather was so bad you couldn't see straight. But they knew there was some land ahead, right? Kind of blurry. And Bolizo, they sounded and found it 20 fathoms. You know, you on these ships, they lowered these anchors to the bottom, and they were... They determine how much fathoms were down there. What's a fathom? This is a fathom. And so, if it went down here, then they knew how deep it was, right? And they got closer to land, they knew how deep that was, and so on. It's a bolizo. And it was 20 fathoms, which would be about 40 yards. So that's pretty deep. There's a fathom. Uh, not this guy, but I mean the length of this. Uh, <laughs> one guy asked me, is that Bob Fathom? No, that's this, this is, is measurement. Fathoms obviously were not exact measurements. Why would that be? Some people have wider. Uh, but anyway, it's an approximate. It's an approximate. Like that guy. And when they had gone a little further, they did it again, and it was down about 30 yards. So they know they're closing in. <clears throat> then fearing that they would go too far and hit the rocks. Again, they got visual problems because of the storm and everything. They were scared of hitting the rocks. They started throwing out anchors. And uh, Pruma. Pruma is the rear of the boat, the stern. And they're trying to slow the ship down. So they're throwing these anchors out. And then they started, Yukumai, this was mistranslated, they started praying. Well, hey, listen, once, once you establish your credibility with sinners, they will respect you even though they don't act like it. Inside here, if you are someone who has, I'm going to say a, say a bad word here, it's kind of kryptonite to Christians, but character. Have you ever met a Christian with character? Probably not, but if you develop character and you have sanctification and you've got a level of holiness and you have got a temperate attitude and you have a loving spirit, sinners on the outside may not like you, but inside they'll respect you. Hey, that person is a man or woman of God. 
let's go abuse them, let's, let's tell them to go screw themselves. But deep down, they know right. you're a different kind of person. Right. Right. They sense love they don't have. Right. They sense integrity they don't have. Right. They sense character they wish they had. Right. And, but they keep it secret because they don't want to face it. So they say, ah, oh, screw you. But down deep they go, I wish I was you. Exactly. It's a trick. Yep. That's what they did to Paul. Everybody respected him. They knew. They knew he had some kind of weird connection in the spirit world to God. They respected him. <clears throat> Somebody who's a true born-again Christian who Who's respected by sinners a lot of times they don't they don't even need to talk much It's just kind of a, a sense that people have When they get around you. Oh gee, there's something different about this person Kind of an odd duck, but Some of them look at him go. Oh, I feel a little uncomfortable around. Well, that's the person's demons are going ugh. Give me a spoon. I... And that's what happened here. They knew there was something different about this credible man of God, Paul. They're throwing the anchors out the back and they're praying, man, I just pray for daylight. And as the shipmen were about to flee the ship, when they let down the boat into the sea, what happened there? Well, these guys. Prophesis they were making a pretense of throwing the anchors out the front of the boat and They were really trying to steal The lifeboat that they had loaded Before the typhoon started They're trying to steal it Because they wanted to escape Why there was almost 300 people on this boat this cargo ship and the, and the lifeboat sat 30, 40, something like that. So these guys were going to leave the rest of them to die. And they were going to hop on the lifeboat, sneak out. Paul caught them. And they were doing it as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. They were faking it. They were pretending to work on the anchors, but they were actually getting ready to dump the lifeboat over. Let that down. They're trying to trick them. Okay. One thing you can tell, tell about the devil, and I guarantee it'll happen, he'll leave you holding the bag every single time. He'll, he'll just kind of blow you over here for a second, trying to get you just a little off course. You're just a, this person, that word, that thought, that attitude, some little thing kind of drifts you over sideways. Then he hits you with a typhoon, and then he just leaves you there. Rot. That's what they were doing. Let's let them all die. Well, Paul said to the centurion and the other soldiers, he said, hey, mm -mm, no. If they get off the ship, you are going to die. God said everybody was going to get saved and the boat was going to be lost <laughs> See when you get your call from God in life, you can't make a decision on how that's Appropriated That's not your job Your job is to go with the flow your job is to get trained your job is to fulfill your call Not be in charge of it We don't have the skill or the knowledge or the experience to be in charge of our call. That's something the Holy Ghost does. That's his job. Our job is to follow where he leads us. <clears throat> hey, you get off the ship, you're done. Guess what happened? They believed him. Why? Hey, sinners will respect you when they see They see you've got some integrity some anointing some Character they see there's something different about you 
they'll listen to you, particularly when you got a track record. Wait a minute, he told us that, that was true, he told us that, that was true, ooh, he just told us that. I guess we better do it. So they cut the lifeboat. It's gone now. So long, sucker. Hey, listen, you know what happened to Paul here? It'll happen to you. He got on that ship a prisoner and ended up the commander of the ship. And here's why. This is what God can do for you. You just follow him if you'll do the right thing. If you'll listen to what he told you. Christians are like stone deaf 90% of the time. If you'll listen to what God tells you, hey, you're not going to be the tail anymore. And you're going to move up here. Paul went from a prisoner to the commander of the ship. God, he went from the bottom of the barrel to selling barrels. Whoa. How'd that happen? Deuteronomy chapter 28 it was already predicted. If you listen, God's going to come through for you. If you don't listen, well, you drifted off with the devil again. While the date was coming on, it says Paul told everybody to eat. Okay, why is he doing that? Well, we're about to get rescued, but this rescue is going to be tough. Wait a minute, I thought this was smooth sailing. No, hey, sometimes to fulfill your call of God, you got to make, I hate to use this other word, it's script tonight, sacrifices. You got to make, it's hard to get out. Sacrifices to fulfill your call from God. You mean I can't just sit here and look gorgeous? Well, it's easier for me to do and hard for you, but <laughs> you got to make sacrifices. Wait a minute. I've been called by God to go to Rome. You mean I got to be shipwrecked? I got to swim to shore on a piece of driftwood? What kind of a God is that? You know, I'm going to do a Bible study on prophecy you know, pretty soon, but just as a preview, there's prophecies are bifurcated. There's supernatural prophecies that are that are fulfilled supernaturally, and there's prophecies that are fulfilled by God using the natural world. Guess which one this is? <clears throat> this is the natural world. God is manipulating events in your life for your benefit. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Oops, that the verse just took a tank. That one tanked. But if you can find a Christian who actually loves him, and what does that mean? If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter. Wait a minute. There's an if in that verse. If you love me. Ooh. Yikes. Oh, boy. Who doesn't love God? Christians who don't keep his commandments. That's what it says. Sorry about that. I'm just reading the scripture. Don't send me an email. If you're not following what he said, that means you don't love him. You might like him. You might be a big Jesus fan. Yahoo! But that isn't going to get you any miracles. You're screwed. He didn't say like. He said love. He said, Paul said, listen, I'm going to have to, we're all going to swim to shore here. The ship's going under. That ain't easy. So this fasting thing got to stop. Okay. 
what? He told him stop fasting. Well, Paul was fasting too. What was he fasting for? That God would save his life and, and do this. No, he was fasting for the other people on the ship. And the angel showed up and said, Hey, Paul, I got you covered. I'm saving everybody on the ship. Not the ship. The cargo ship's going under. Pharaoh won't like that. Well, too bad. Stop fasting. Okay? I don't have time to do a Bible study on fasting, but if you haven't renewed your mind and you're still having problems with your Christian life and you're knocking off a little porn once in a while, you're yelling at somebody, you're getting an argument, it's a different thing. I got news for you. <laughs> fasting is not going to work for you. What you need to do is what the Bible calls Matano ale. It's a Greek word for repentance. I know that's kryptonite. Repentance. Matano ale. What does that mean? To go back the other direction. Oh, I'm repenting. I'm going that way. See that? I was going to go over and talk to her, and then I repented. Now I'm going over here. See that? Okay. Repentance comes first. Fasting later. Well, they went 14 days. I'll tell you what, I don't know how these sailors, man, they must have been in top shape, great physical specimens to do all this work and make it through a typhoon fasting. Utterly amazing. He says, I pray you take me. This is for your health. That was mistranslated. This Greek word here, soteria, means salvation. It's the same word used for spiritual salvation. What he was saying there, you gotta, you've got to eat something, it'll save your life. Because, I don't want to tell you this right this second, we're going overboard. And you've got to have your strength to make it to Malta, to shore. But, listen to this, I heard from God, and I believe God, not one of you. Nobody is going to die. You'll all be saved. And when he spoke, he took bread and he gave thanks. Wow, what a story there. Most, most born-again Christians, when things go to hell in a handbasket, they're filing complaints, they're griping, they're questioning things, they're confused. They're going to get advice from 50 different sources, all of them contradictory. The best thing to do, believe it or not, is in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> if I gave the devil 10 things he didn't like, what would be the number one there? I'm not exactly sure, but one of them would be thanking God while he's beating the crap out of you. That's got to drive him crazy. Why? Praise is cheap. You know what? Church praise is cheap. A lot of it's a bunch of crap. Because when things are going your way and everything is going well, that's easy praise. It's easy to praise God when things are falling in your lap. It's all lining up. Everybody likes you. Some of you have never had that, but a few of you, a few of you have had it. But no, that's easy to praise there. See, you know, a disciples, they give thanks in the middle of a typhoon. Wow. You got the calling of God on your life here, and everything's going bad, and He is thankful. That's a good lesson. We broke bread, He began to eat. Then were they of good cheer. 
and they ate. That's what Paul told Timothy. He said, listen, Timothy, son, let me talk to you for a minute. You're starting to crack. Okay, and I get it. Persecution is bad. Jews and Romans trying to kill you, bad. I get it. You're taking a beating. Okay? But listen, <clears throat> in order to serve God and fulfill your call, and you remember your grandmother used to pray for you all the time, and she used to give you the scriptures. Remember that, Timothy? Yes, I do. And you've been called by God to be a Holy Ghost, super-powered preacher and apostle and evangelist. You've been called by God, Timothy. And God didn't give you the spirit of a coward. He gave you love. He gave you power. He gave you a sound mind. Okay. Everybody, all of us, need to be reminded here and there what we were called to be because during periods of adversity when you're in a typhoon from Satan sometimes your mind can get confused you start to think which way do I turn what decision do I make now what's happening here stress causes people to act and think in ways they would never normally act or think right Guess how many souls were on that boat? Man, that's a lot. We know three of them were disciples. So that means 373 of them may have been unsaved people. But I doubt if they stayed that way. You have good cheer. They cheered up. When they'd eaten enough, they'd lighten the ship. What's going on there? They're throwing more crap out of the ship. Trying to keep the thing above the waves now it got so bad they threw out what the money big money big money Egypt the number one exporter of, of agriculture on the planet earth Egypt biggest thing in the world they were throwing the wheat and the corn over the edge wow what a waste nobody cared they all wanted to just live when it was day they knew not the land they couldn't see it and they discovered discovered a certain creek a culpus is a is the Greek word for bosom you remember when it said uh, uh, Peter Peter wanted to ask Jesus a question but they they got they went through John because John was laying on Jesus bosom right. remember that that was the same same Greek word well that Greek word for bosom special spot you know, like a child and a mother has a special spot here that nobody else fits there, particularly when they're nursing. Nobody else in the family nurses. They're adult. The baby, uh, that's a culpus. And they also use it to describe a bay. So you've got the sea out here and then an inlet. That was a bay. And so what this, one's, this one means bay, not a bosom. And it's had a shoreline on it. And they wanted to shove the ship into this bay, save their lives. What's that saying? Right? And then it says, believe it or not, in Malta, it's still named St. Paul's Bay. And here it is. It's a tourist attraction now. Christians from all over the world go visit there because that's where Paul was shipwrecked. For some reason, they like that. But there it is. That's a, that's a pretty current picture of it. Hotels. It's a bay. See that? <clears throat> That's where they tried to shove their ship in there. And when they took up the anchors, they let the ship go and they loosed the rudders. They hoisted up the sail again and they tried to drive into that bay to save their lives, basically with the Sasan, trying to head for the shore. Right? So, Falling to a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground. Uh-oh. They didn't make it to the shore or the sand, the beach. They hit rocks. And the front of the boat stuck in the rocks. The back of the boat, waves banging it. 
And this is what Paul was telling them. I think he saw a vision of this. He saw the shipwrecking. I can't prove that, but I think that's what happened. And then he saw this thing snap. And everybody had to dive into the water. And then it says the hinder part broke off because of how vicious the waves were. Just the boat just snapped. This is a gigantic cargo ship. The storm must have been unbelievable. Bad. And the soldiers on the ship were going to do what? Why are they doing that? Yeah, and if they got away, right? Roman uh, Roman soldiers and jailers. If the convict got away, they they killed the jailer. Remember that with Paul and Silas say, hey, the jailer started to kill himself. They yelled at him, hey, we're all here. Because the guy was going to commit suicide because he thought they had escaped. Remember that? What is that? Acts 23, 22, something like that. Thereabouts. <clears throat> I forgot. But Hey, these prisoners, they weren't going to let any of them get away. They were going to kill Paul and Luke and Arcteus. But, oh yeah. Yeah, you know when you're when you're in God's will and you haven't wavered off over here or drifted over there God uses sinners to save you He'll use the government to help you the government that's incredible That can't be Yeah He'll use anything to save you Nothing's off the table and They were going to murder everybody including Paul, but the centurion willing to save Paul Kept them from their purpose And he told them listen dive in swim the shore Just like Paul said God had prophesied about it Fantastic. You need to remember this verse, and of course, you already got it memorized. If you're in God's will and you're patient, like Paul was, even these people that hate your guts, he'll use them to help you. There aren't any Christians around to help me. I don't have anybody to pray for me. <laughs> Stop it. That has nothing to do with God's provision. It comes through anyway. Doesn't care if there's nobody to help you. You a zero? No problemo. He's going to show. That's what it says. And the rest, some on boards, some on parts of the ship, they all escaped swimming to land in the middle of a storm. That's a miracle. Now notice that there's no supernatural events here. One day Jesus was on a ship and they hit a massive storm on the Sea of Galilee. And one of the biggest miracles Anywhere in the Bible happened the ship suddenly it says Was it shore where they were going the ship and everybody on it teleported To the shore How does that happen? I have no idea I don't have any special knowledge about teleportation But notice that didn't happen here See, sometimes God will use a supernatural event to help you, and other times he'll use natural events he manipulates. So if you're looking for a light in the sky and a meteor up your fanny, that may not be how God's going to help you. It may be just somebody handing you something, some got a note you got a call a little might be something natural coming to your aid not a supernatural bolt of light now if you're a prophetic or a charismatic you want the bolt of light ooh 
But sometimes God doesn't give you an ooh. He uses natural things to guide you this way. I had a guy come in for counseling one time. He was down in the dumps. He'd been dating this gal for a couple of years. Something like that, a year and a half. And, you know, he's really, I mean, he's down. Emotionally down. She just up and dumped the guy. I mean, boom, like flipping a light switch. Nothing. Stopped calling, stopped answering the phone, just like that. This guy's down in the dumps and, you know, he's telling me, he was telling me about himself and then he was telling me about her. So I had a lot of personal information about both of them. And he gets through telling me the sob story. I go, I got a big old smile on my face. I said, that was a great story. I am so happy for you. He's staring at me like I got Ebola. I said, listen, that woman was a plant. And had you married her, your life would have been a living hell. God drifted her off. Was there a bolt of light or an angel? No. No, it's just a subtle, I'm saving you. And the person's gone. That happens all the time. Amen. Yeah, no meteor. <laughs> oh, it's a sign from God. No, it was just a move out, move that one out, move this one over. Now, Paul would have had, would have, I'm sure if I interviewed the guy, I'm sure he'd come in and I could, I could fix him. What a, I'm sure the guy would have wanted a teleportation experience. Wouldn't you if you interviewed him? Paul, would you like to teleport through the typhoon? And Yeah, that sounds good to me. No, you're not getting a supernatural miracle. You're getting a natural miracle. Miracle. I'm going to manipulate your environment so that you come out on top. See the difference? Yeah, everything isn't exploding with glorious experiences. Oh, wow. Sometimes you got to come in and sit and talk to Brother Mike and tell him about how depressed you are over some girl who leaves you. And you got to overcome the trauma of me smiling. <laughs> Dude, you dodged a bullet. By the time he left, he was so happy. He finally saw it from God's perspective. The Holy Ghost just, he wasn't hurting her. He just moved her out. He loved her, but he knew that wasn't, it was a here, not a here. My father knows these things, obviously. They all escaped, just like that guy did. They escaped to a safe, all safe on land. Wow. What happened when he got there? Do you remember? Well, it was something else. See, once you, once you don't drift off, if you don't drift off and you stay what you know God's called you to do. Well, Brother Mike, I don't have a call from God on my life, okay? Okay, yes you do. The Bible's full of them. Develop your character. How about your integrity? How about your prayer life? How's your Bible study life? How's, how's your attitude towards yourself and others? Sometimes he has you develop you first before you get a call to go serve. Sometimes that happens. Brother Mike, I got called to preach when I was 21 years old. 
well, listen, I believe you, but, you know, you have a seat. Uh, you know, your personality is a little bit abrasive. Uh, your personality, uh, no offense, is sucks. Okay, in order to be in the ministry, you've got to develop some interpersonal skills. Oh, man. Well, Brother Mike, I was raised in a gang, and I... Okay, people in gangs have certain personality types, but maybe God's going to have to rough off those edges of your gang personality before you're able to <laughs> fit comfortably with compassion, praying for someone to see them healed, okay? Get healed now! No, I don't think that's going to work. We might have to rub off the rough edges of your old gang life. Thank God you got saved. Praise God for that. But if you've been called to preach, you get you know, a little different personality. I don't be a counselor like you, Mike. Well, first of all, you'll never de develop that level of skill. But if you want to be a counselor, you got to have some capacity to listen. <gasps> listen! Oh! Oh! I like to talk. <laughs> Go to Proverbs and find out idiots talk all the time. You want to see an idiot? You want to see one? Stay silent and just listen. Blah, 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 blah. Praise God. Bible birth this book. Bible birth this book. Pardon me a minute. I got gas. Blah, 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 blah. As soon as you hear somebody talk, you're the greatest counselor in the world. You're sitting quietly and listen to them. You become a psychiatric genius. People who yik and yak a lot make poor counselors. No offense. That's your call. It may be a personal call before you get the call. There's different levels of calls. There are different types of calls. Brother Mike, I just want, I just want to be in the ministry and, you know, how do you feel about people? Well, they get on my nerves. Whoop, beep. We can't go in the ministry, Connie, until you, don't, you have problems with people. They get on your nerves. Well, let's hold down, let's hold that ministry down a bit here. Don't yell at me, but time out. Stupid. You need your personality adjusted. Well, how does that happen? Oh, you don't want to know. You don't want to know. It's not people telling you what a wonderful person you are 10 hours a day. No. It's adversity changes your personality. Sometimes you need to be beat down and then whipped. What kind of a sermon is in this? I'm going to go back to Joel Olstein. What this is is reality. This is reality. This isn't Joel Olstein. This is what has to happen. Your personality may need to be beaten. See? Do you ever, do you ever see f people fish? I did when I was young. I'm from Kansas. Everybody fishes. Well, if you're fishing off the bottom, in Kansas, you get a little bored, so you grab a stick. You pull out a, not a switchblade, a pocket knife. And you sit on the Shore, whittling, watching the line. Well, when you whittle somebody's personality, sometimes there's a little pain to that. I think I'm doing wonderful. I'm just doing great. Hold on a minute. You made these three mistakes. Oh, that hurt me. Now God's trying to get you to understand, hey, He's correcting you not to hurt you, but to help you. Don't start feeling pain like you're being rejected. You're being helped. He's whittling, whittling your personality off.
People who talk all the time can't understand why they get on other people's nerves. It's like a giant mystery to what happened. I think I'm under satanic attack. No, the attack is coming out of your flapping gums. Okay, and my job as a counselor is to tell you what you're doing. Don't send me an email calling me the, the Antichrist. I'm trying to save you. Blah, 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 blah. That gets on people's nerves. Whittle, 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 whittle. And just two weeks ago, married couple came to come in, wanted counseling. Oh, man! I tell you what, it was a bad case, bad case. <clears throat> His wife had deep-seated insecurities, and when he wasn't around at work or somewhere else, the demons would put these thoughts in her mind, paranoid thoughts. What's he doing? Who's he talking to? Maybe some chick with bigger breasts was talking to him with a better booty. Oh, my God, I can't. Some gal's coming after his bootylish. How does that work? Well, how it works is the demons put these paranoid thoughts in your mind. I said to her, and what you're doing is ruining your own marriage. Do you have any evidence the guy's uh, running around with truckloads of whores? Or no, I don't have any. Do you have any? Do you catch him on the phone? You got. If you searched his phone, has he got a bunch of hookers on? No, they're not. The I said, wait a minute, you're the one ruining the marriage, not him. You got demonic paranoia. <gasps> My God, where is he? I just called. He never answered. <laughs> What's he doing? Is he? Is he got enough some chick with a 40D cup? What's happening? <laughs> what? Are, I mean, let me find the guy. Demonic paranoia. You pursuing. And hurling false accusations and saying negative things is going to do what? Split! I said, I don't know. Are, are you sure, Mother Mike? I said, I am sure. Now let's talk about what you're going to do after you're divorced. Stone silence. We've got to prepare for your divorce here if you're not going to change. What are you going to do? Where are you going to live? How are you going to survive? All of a sudden, she had an attitude adjustment. It was a miracle. <laughs> See, it's not a flash of light sometimes. It's not a earthquake. It's not the fire. It's not the wind. Sometimes it's just a still, small voice. Maybe we ought to pray about being fearful and paranoid. Let's find out where that came from. Oh, I drifted back to her past. Her dad, when she was in grade school, that's where it started. Her dad. Come on. What happened to Paul after he stayed the course? Oh man! As soon as he got on the island, all the island people, the barbarians, it says. The Greek word is foreigners. They all came up to help him. They they were freezing to death. They just got out of the ocean. They built him a fire. Remember that? Acts 28. And then what happened? Paul is helping out with a fire. Oh, man. Can you imagine that? The greatest apostle to ever live does grunt work. Well, that should have landed. <laughs> Somebody here has got to have some sense of spirituality. It can't be just two of you. How can the guy at the top do grunt work? Jesus has said the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve. Paul is out scooping up sticks. The Apostle Paul, who just saved 275 people from a typhoon, because he heard from God. He was the commander of the ship, not the prisoner. He is scooping up sticks.
What happens to him? Well, the good Lord screwed up again. I got to get him in there. Counseling. Fix him. Boom! An adder bites him. Right on the arm. He was in the sticks. The barbarians see it. The foreigner, they're looking at him. The guys on the island go, oh my gosh. See, in their mind, if something bad happened to somebody, it means that they were sinning and God was taking retribution on them. That was their mindset. So they saw Paul with a snake on his arm. Oh, this guy must have been a killer, a murderer, a rapist. He's getting what he deserves. Well, he was getting what he deserved, but not in the way they said it. He flips his arm. The snake falls in the fire. Revelation 20. An unknown angel comes out of heaven, grabs the devil. Not Michael or Gabriel, some angel nobody had heard of, comes down and grabs the devil and takes him and throws him in the lake of fire. He threw that snake, tossed it in the fire, picks up the sticks, again, goes about his grunt work. Wow. I've been called in the ministry, Brother Mike. Can you sweep the floor? No, I can't do that. I, I just want to preach. <laughs> you ignorant fool. Servants are at the top of the ministry stack. Servants sit at the top. They serve. They don't want to be served. Now they looked at him and said, Oh my God. He's some kind of deity. This guy... Swam the shore off a boat that crumbled in the sea. Now the snakes don't even bother him. He must seem to be some kind of deity. Listen, if you'll stay your course at some point in time, even people that don't like you will love you. They'll respect you. What else happened? Well, the guy that was running the island, the big cheese, guess what he had? He gave them everything they needed. Hey, you get to eat here. Here's the food. Here's the lodging. No problemo. Everything went his way. Notice that all hell had broken loose here, but after Paul stayed steady, then it was smooth sailing. Now what happened? He held a healing service for the whole island. All these barbarians got here healed, including Publius. He had cholera. He was dying. He got healed. Can you imagine that? Then when they boarded the next transport, they loaded them up with benefits. Just like the Jews coming out of Egypt. Oh, man, the Egyptians were so glad to get rid of them. They were throwing Gold and bracelets and food and provisions. Get out of here. Listen, if you'll change your attitude and your integrity and your character and everything, the devil's going to get so sick of you, he's just going to go, Get out of here. You're driving me nuts. I trashed you and you were giving thanks. I don't want to hear it. Go! Ahead, man. Go! That's what happened in the temptation of Christ. Nailed him with a third verse out of Deuteronomy. He bolts. I can't stand this anymore. I can't stop. Your praise drives him crazy. He'll listen for a minute, and then he's got to go. If he prays too much, if he could, he'd slit his wrist. I've had enough of that. <laughs> they loaded him up with gifts, just like the Jews in Egypt. They left with everything. Where do you think they got all that gold to make that golden calf? Egyptian donations. Where do you think they got the idea to make that golden calf? An Egyptian god. That's how they backslid. What triggered it? What triggers a relapse for an alcoholic? What triggers a relapse for a drug addict? What is it? What is it? 
Fear. Satan's number one tool. Fear causes people to relapse. Fear caused the Jews to make that golden calf. Why? Moses had disappeared. The guy who brought them out of Egypt, he, he was gone. They thought he was eaten by lions or he left or moved. He wasn't coming back. And fear caused them to relapse into idolatry. That's why they made that calf. They were scared. They wanted somebody to comfort them. Yeah, they loaded up the gifts and left. When Paul came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. Paul was allowed to dwell by himself with just one guard. Again, once you fulfill your call and you stayed steady, the favor of God falls on you. There's no more typhoons here. There's no more shipwreck. There's nobody stand. I don't want to listen to you talk to the hand. We're going to go anyway. That was all over. But he stayed steady. See? What happened to you? You failed. You didn't stay steady. Now what do you got to do? The ship drifts over to a port and it just stops. And then it waits for you to change. If you don't change, it stays docked. And then it says, Paul dwelt two years in his own rented home. <laughs> God gave him his dream. He made it to Rome. And he brought his ministry with him. Would it have happened had he cracked under the pressure? No. No. <clears throat> Some prophecies God gives are unconditional and some are conditional. Okay. The second coming is an unconditional prophecy. Nothing you ever do or ever say will change that prophecy. It's going to happen no matter what. Right? These prophecies were all conditional. Paul said, listen, I prophesied to you that everybody on this boat was going to survive. But if you get off the boat, the prophecy's canceled and you die. Some prophecies are conditional. Some are unconditional. The Bible says that God loves you unconditionally. That means whether you sin or not, whether you're good or not, doesn't matter. You're eligible for all the benefits of God if you repent. However, the love of God no longer works when you're dead and in hell. You can't get out. The rapture is an unconditional prophecy. The dead in Christ shall rise first. After that, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord. There we will ever be with the Lord. That is going to happen no matter what you do or say. However, whether you specifically go in the rapture, Depends on you.
these prophecies God gave Paul? Conditional. You don't fulfill the requirements of the prophecy, it's revoked. God prophesied to me, Brother Mike, that if I keep praying for my daughter, she's going to come. She's going to come to the Lord someday. That's a conditional prophecy. He said, if you keep praying for it, what if the person stops praying for him? Gone. God gave you a prophecy. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Oops, that's a conditional prophecy. What if you stop believing? All things are not possible to you if you do not believe. Conditional prophecies are up to you. You mean I can cancel out God's prophecies? You can conditional ones. You cannot unconditional ones. Nothing you do or say can cancel an unconditional prophecy. Nineteen ninety six, <clears throat> somebody I respected enormously, strong spiritual man of God. My youngest daughter got in a car accident. She was brain dead in the uh, Boswell Hospital in Sunny Slope. Uh, is that the name of the hospital? I just drew a blank on it for some reason. The hospital in Sunny Slope, my, da my daughter's in ICU in there. She's brain dead. And this guy gave me this word he got from God. John C. Lincoln, excuse me. Thank you. John C. Lincoln, not, not Boswell. I'm in Sun City now, so I had Boswell on my mind. But <clears throat> plus I'm old. I'm at John C. Lincoln, and this... Situations beyond anything I can even imagine. I didn't know what to do. I was utterly lost. I was a destroyed, broken human. And some guy says, uh, you know what? I, just, I, I was praying for your daughter the other day. I got a strange sense that uh, she's going to be well. She's going she's gonna to get out of here. She's going to survive. She's gonna, and, oh, wow, that's weird. Okay, you know, everything, every medical, every medical indicator, anywhere, everywhere, I lost her. <laughs> what hurt me was she was <clears throat> the only one in my family that liked me. Nobody else liked me, and of course, those people are sick. I mean, what's wrong with them? But but to make a long, real long story short, she woke up. She went home. Then I was praying one day, and I had this incredible sense come over me was at the altar at the Bell Road Assembly of God. I had this powerful sense come over me that 
God was going to take care of my daughter. And, you know, 25 years later or something, I go over to pick her up to spend the night with, with me for a couple of days from her mom. Her mom's her caregiver. So I was going to watch her for a couple of days, spend some time with her. And I pick her up and I notice she's, she doesn't look quite right. <clears throat> and uh, she was, her breathing was different. I didn't think anything of it. Well, later that night, uh, her breathing was getting a little worse. Her mother uh, had left to go on a cruise to uh, Alaska. And uh, so she was going to stay with me for a while. And uh, I go, man, she's not, she's kind of, Huffing, you know, and I, I said, honey, are you all right? I'm trying to investigate it and it's not looking good and uh, That night it's worse and I says, you know, honey, you know now she's going like this <sighs> You know, so I Said look honey, I'm gonna give you tonight But if you're not any better in the morning, I'm gonna take you to the hospital She gets up the next morning. It, she's worse. I get her ready. I put her in the wheelchair. We head out to Boswell Hospital. And uh, come to find out she had pneumonia. And uh, her breathing is getting really bad at the hospital. So uh, that night I went home. And I was praying. I said, Lord, no, you remember. I remember 25 years ago, 24 years ago. I, I remember I was down there praying. <laughs> I remember. You told me. I knew it. You said, You take care of her. I can't take care of her. So that you're her father. I'm her dad. There's a difference. I'm just her dad. I said, I kept reminding him, I didn't hear nothing. No lights, no meteors, nothing. No clouds, no glory cloud. I go into the hospital the next day. I walk in the back from the parking lot and uh, head to the cafeteria as I always do. I like the cafeteria. That's my favorite place, the cafeteria at the hospital. So I go in there and I hear on the loudspeakers all through the hospital, boop, 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 code blue, code blue, please come to the room, such and such and such, code blue, all per medical personnel, blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking, oh man, I better. So I sit sitting in my chair and I go, Lord, please bless that guy uh, that's a code blue. He sounds like somebody's dying. Put your hand on him and say, I'm praying for the guy. So I grab my stuff. From my from the cafeteria, I head up to the, my daughter's room on the, what was the third or fourth floor. I can't remember anymore. I come walking in. And I look down the hall there, and I said, "Well, how come there's like 15 people in my daughter's room? Why is everybody in there? What's going on here?" So I get down there. The code blue I had heard in the cafeteria was was her. She died on me again, and. Just sitting there going, hey, you told me you got discovered. I know you got it. I'm good. I'm good with this. I'm going to have a little cry here, and then I'm going to crank my praise up. I throttled my praise, Harley. I let it go. And they put her in a uh, what's that thing they put down you? What's that? Yeah, they put this thing down her throat, and it was this machine was breathing for her. And you know, it was about a week. She fine. We went home.
See, I want to be like Paul. I want to stay on that ship and not try to cheat and get in the lifeboat. I want to stay steady while hell was staring me in the face. Oh, that poor guy. Yeah, I was the poor guy. Let's pray.